many flat earth proofs and also explained his wonderful map. In 1899, South African flat earth author Thomas Winship published his excellent work, Zetetic Cosmogony, Evidence that the World is Not a Rotating Revolving Globe, but a Stationary Plain Circle. 1903 marked the beginning of airplane travel, which, had it been invented in Copernicus's era, would have destroyed his spinning ball earth fantasy long before takeoff. When hot air balloons were first invented, people were told the reason they cannot simply float in the air and wait for the spinning ball earth to bring their destinations to them was because gravity somehow stuck the entire atmosphere and everything in it in place, dragging it along at a thousand miles per hour so uniformly that we can't see it, feel it, hear it, or measure it in any way. Once airplane technology evolved so that we could fly at comparable speeds to the Earth's supposed rotation, however, it became immediately apparent that the Earth and its atmosphere could not be constantly rotating a thousand miles per hour west to east. Simply put, if the Earth were constantly spinning eastward a thousand miles per hour, then airplane flight durations going eastwards versus westwards would be significantly different. If the average commercial airliner travels 500 miles per hour, it follows that westbound equatorial flights should reach their destination at approximately three times the speed as their eastbound return flights. In reality, however, the differences in east and westbound flight durations usually amount to a matter of minutes, and nothing near what would occur on a thousand mile per hour spinning ball earth. For example, flights eastward with the alleged spin of the ball earth from Tokyo to LA take an average of 10.5 hours. Therefore, the return flights westwards against the alleged spin should take an average of 5.25 hours, but in actual fact, take an average of 11.5 hours. Also of note, if Earth were a globe, there are several flights in the southern hemisphere which would have the quickest, straightest path over the Antarctic continent, such as Santiago, Chile, to Sydney, Australia. Instead of taking the shortest, quickest route in a straight line over Antarctica, all such flights detour all manner of directions away from Antarctica instead, claiming the temperatures too cold for airplane travel. Considering the fact that there are plenty of flights to from and over Antarctica, and NASA claims to have technology keeping them in conditions far colder and far hotter than any experienced on Earth. Such an excuse is clearly just an excuse, and these flights aren't made because they are impossible. If the Earth was a ball and Antarctica was too cold to fly over, the only logical way to fly from Sydney to Santiago would be a straight shot over the Pacific, staying in the southern hemisphere the entire way. Refueling could be done in New Zealand or other southern hemisphere destinations along the way if absolutely necessary. In actual fact, however, Santiago to Sydney flights go into the northern hemisphere, making stopovers at LAX and other North American airports before continuing back down to the southern hemisphere. Such ridiculously wayward detours make no sense on the globe, but make perfect sense and form nearly straight lines when shown on a flat earth map. On a ball earth, Johannesburg, South Africa to Perth, Australia should be a straight shot over the Indian Ocean with convenient refueling possibilities on Mauritius or Madagascar. In actual practice, however, most Johannesburg to Perth flights curiously stop over either in Dubai, Hong Kong, or Malaysia, all of which make no sense on the ball, but are completely understandable when mapped on a flat earth. A casual study of other South Hemisphere flight paths and stopover points will prove to even the most staunch skeptic the clear illegitimacy of globe map projections. Building on Michelson and Morley's experiment, in 1913, French physicist Georges Sagnac again proved the existence of the ether and the stillness of Earth by using a beam splitter to send light in opposite directions around a path, recombining them, then observing their interference fringes, first while stationary, and then while rotating the entire experiment table two revolutions per second. The changes in interference patterns between the moving and non-moving trials proved that the light, and therefore the Earth, was stationary. In 1914, William Westfield wrote his geocentric classic, Does the Earth Rotate? No. And when Gerard Hickson's masterpiece, King's Dethroned, A History of the Evolution of Astronomy from the Time of the Roman Empire up to the Present Day, was published in 1922, the heliocentric theory of the universe was on its last legs. In 1925, the Michelson-Gale experiment again vouched for a stationary Earth, and it was clear to the establishment that they needed something big to bring public opinion back there.